This episode of Own the Gray is brought to you by I Am. Discover your unique talents, realize your potential, and align to your path. Take the first step to uncover your life purpose by visiting deborahjones.ca slash courses. Welcome to On the Grey, a podcast to dispel the notion that aging is undesirable and setting new positive attitudes. I'm Deborah Jones, and I believe you can be vibrant and healthy throughout the best years of your life. Today on Own the Grey, we have Dr. Danielle Marshallton, a licensed naturopathic doctor from the Collective Health Clinic in Orangeville, Ontario, Canada. You may remember her from episode 19 when we were talking about menopause, and I invited her back to share her wisdom on other issues that we women suffer from. So thank you for joining us again, Dr. Danielle. Yes, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm thrilled to be back. It's great to have you because I know you have such a passion for women's health and women's wellness, and you also have a lot of wisdom based on some of the research that you're always doing. You're always learning new things that are coming up. Isn't that right? Absolutely. And I think particularly with this subject around women's health and menopause, the uh, research in this field of medicine is really evolving, particularly from uh, since 2001, when there was a, a big study done called the Women's Health Initiative that has largely been refuted since, um, but has really taught the medical professional to sort of go with the narrative that we should fear estrogen. Um, when in fact, I, I find, you know, we now know better and the opposite is true that we need to learn to love estrogen. Mm, I love that. So tell us what kinds of complaints do women come to you with that are related to what we're talking about? Sure. I think probably the most common two symptoms I would say that I hear from menopausal women are both hot flashes and sleep disruption. Um, And they can both, they can coexist. I can see one over the other. Hot flashes, of course, causing sleep disruption, but I also have uh, just as many women who are waking frequently uh, without hot flashes. But those are the two main ones. You know, the other one that I think surprised me uh, is the amount of genitourinary symptoms that I'm seeing in this this demographic. So vaginal dryness, uh, chronic bladder infections or bladder discomfort, prolapses, that kind of thing that are really affecting uh, menopausal women. I think we're just, we have some voices now um, compared to you know, 50 to 60 years ago, women were suffering and weren't saying anything. Mm -hmm. Um, So it is, it is a massively evolving field. And I'm, and I am so honored to take part in helping these women feel better. Yeah. I'm glad we've got you on our side. Yeah, (laughs) It's great to to have somebody who who can actually really understand what's going on, because I know, you know, in in my mother's day when she would go to the doctor and nine times out of 10, (laughs) or maybe 10 out of 10 at that time would be a male doctor. And, you know, they, they have their knowledge, but they don't have any experience and they also have a different perspective. Do you think men are equipped to help women with menopause? Um, No, I don't. I don't. I I don't. I'm not questioning competency here. I'm questioning the ability to therapeutically connect and understand where the patient's coming from, or even properly put that female into context so that when she is saying, I can't like my quality of life is largely disrupted because I'm having hot flashes 30 times a day uh, to have a, a male doctor look back at her and say, you know, well, women have been doing this for years. So just, just Hmm. push through it. Mm -hmm. I think that's dismissive. I think we know better. I think it is a huge injustice to these female patients. Um, uh, I am, I will say though, I am, I do become a little shocked. I, I have heard through patients that some female practitioners still, I mean, you know, when I hear a negative response or, or that, that fearing estrogen narrative come from a female gynecologist, for example, mm-hmm. I will check on her age, right? I'll ask mm-hmm. the patient, well, 
ballpark her age for me because there's a pretty good chance she's pre-menopausal. Mm-hmm. It, it is hard to gauge the effect of menopause until you're really going through it. <laughs> um, but I, I until you're until you're in the midst of it because we it's similar to uh, being in labor, right? You always hear how bad it is, but you don't really know <laughs> until you've gone through it. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so I, I mean, I definitely find I, I'm up against resistance with more male doctors for sure in terms of. I mean, I like to be fully transparent um, with my patient's healthcare team. So if I have a patient who's starting a prescription, I want them to fully inform their their family practitioner or their gynecologist or whoever uh, what they're doing. And I think I definitely see more resistance from the male side. Um, mm-hmm. I, I know some family doctors uh, who are male, the second you bring up uh, hot flashes or anything that has to do with female reproductive, uh, it's an automatic referral for them. And I really respect that, mm. right. That they can recognize that they, they maybe don't have the capacity to fully care for this patient because they can't, they can't empathize with how this must be for them. So that I, I, and I see that and I, and I really respect that, right. Like, oh, you know, whoa, yeah. okay. I'm going to send you to a female gynecologist who can further do like, I, I think that's phenomenal. Yeah. But Otherwise I'm, I'll fight the fight for them. I'll send the studies and the, you know what I mean? Like I'll, I'll do my due diligence to show that, that male doctor. And I've, and I've seen, I mean, like I said, I've come across resistance even within, uh, mostly within the area to which I practice. And I send the studies, I send the, the communication to prove that this is a good therapeutic choice for the patient. And I'm slowly seeing leaves turn over. So mm-hmm. it's working. Uh, one doctor at a time, but I'm <laughs> well, that, that, that's great. There's progress in that department. Yes. But the, the one thing that came to mind as you were talking is it isn't black and white, this, this uh, women's health and, and even, you know, the idea of menopause, it's, there's no one size fits all. There's no textbook mm-hmm. version is there. And so there's, a, no. there's so many different layers um, emotional, mental, mm-hmm. you know, physical and spiritual, all, all, all four of them are involved in this. And, and it takes somebody with, with some compassion and understanding of, you know, that everybody's journey is different. And, mm-hmm. and I think that's what you do as, as a naturopathic doctor to really ask some questions and go much deeper than the surface. How important do you think that is? Uh, very. I mean, I think it's something that's really, uh, it's it's foundational to a naturopathic doctor's process to individualize every single treatment plan, right? So I don't treat a diagnosis. I don't treat a disease. I'm treating a person. Mm-hmm. So, which, you know, and, and I can only, I can speak for Ontario where, whereby we spend a lot of time uh, with our patients. So, you know, 10 minutes with a patient, I, I can learn about the symptom, but I can't put that into context, right? Mm-hmm. Half an hour, an hour, sometimes more with patients. And now I've got a really good idea of what this symptom looks like in the life and world of this patient. And, and menopause here is no exception, right? If, if I have a female coming to me saying, I'm anxious, I'm having more feelings of sadness. Yes, I have hot flashes. And I don't ask, uh, what does stress look like? What does your diet look like? What about lifestyle? What's your support network look like? Um, if I don't have all of those pieces, I won't get full resolution. I will, I, I'll be limited in terms of how much, I, how effective I can be. Mm, that's really important. Yeah, for sure. So then let's talk a little bit about hot flashes. What mm. are they? And what, what can you share with us about that? Mm-hmm. So hot flashes are very dynamic in the sense that there's really, there's sort of two separate things going on. So initially when the ovaries start to decline in their output of hormones and and also ovulation, uh, there is a brain hormone called luteinizing hormone. I'll short form that to LH. For people listening, if they've ever been through fertility treatment, uh, LH will surge around day 14, which increases our body temperature. And that usually equates in an ovulation. In perimenopause, when the ovaries start to slow down, LH surges at day 14 and there's no ovulation. So LH will surge again and there's still no ovulation. LH will continue to surge. And as we know, LH increases our basal body temperature or our core body temperature. So every time we get that LH surge, we can go into a hot flash. 
As things start to progress into full-blown menopause, whereby you don't, you no longer have a period, what's happening is the drop in estrogen uh, really increases our sympathetic nervous system activation or our, our capacity for managing that. So certain things will bring, will start to bring hot flashes on. Anything that increases sympathetic nervous system will do so. So stress, I have lots of, and you know, even I have lots of patients who will talk to me about how horrible their hot flashes are. Mm -hmm. And as they're talking about how horrible their hot flashes are, it brings on a hot flash. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Stress, well, I mean, it isn't, but <laughs> Well, right. But like, even just the stress of telling me how horrible they are uh, will bring them on. And wow. then of course there are things, uh, anything that vasodilates, but that we put in our body. So, you know, one of the results of that sympathetic activation is a huge vasodilation. Our blood vessels increase in diameter, which allows for that flush and that quick surge in, in blood flow. Um, so other things that will do this, uh, coffee, chocolate, um, alcohol, particularly red wine. Uh, red wine is a huge vasodilator. I've got patients who drink a lot of coffee and drink quite a bit of red wine, particularly coming out of COVID. And even when we just drop those out, we can see such an improvement in hot flashes alone. Wow. That's pretty incredible. So what my mind is going to is feeling hot at nighttime in bed. Is that a hot flash yeah. or is that something else? It's a dysregulation of your core body temperature, right? So your own thermostat has gone awry. There is a connection to circadian rhythm. But this is why some women only feel hot or only have hot flashes at night, because there is a connection between um, time of day, things like melatonin secretion. Uh, so we do know that, we're, you know, nighttime certainly puts us at higher risk for a dysregulation in body temperature and therefore a higher vulnerability to go towards a hot flash. Hot flashes are defined by that surge of temperature. Feeling hot throughout the night isn't diagnostically a hot flash, but still tightly connected to menopause. Hmm. And so that leads us into the conversation that we had when we decided we would do a podcast on it. And that is the link with the thyroid. Can you share with us if there is a link? And if so, what is it? There, there are links. The term being used right now in studies is it's an indirect link, meaning that estrogen as a result of higher or lower levels the other thing I'll mention is that the thyroid and the ovaries are constantly talking to each other. Okay. So we know if I have a 30 year old female who hasn't had a period in three months, I'm going to check her thyroid. I would never assume that that's perimenopause because of her age, but I'm going to check her thyroid because the ovaries and the thyroid are constantly communicating. Now there's a couple of situations here that we have to talk about because the thyroid is really sensitive to both high levels of estrogen and low. So when levels go high, which they will in perimenopause, right? We actually can see an overcompensation by the ovaries where we end up having periods of really high estrogen. Mm -hmm. This will increase something called thyroxine binding globulin. Thyroxine binding globulin will attach to active thyroid hormone and decrease the presence of thyroid hormone in our cells. So it can create like a mm -hmm. hypo or a low thyroid picture. Uh, the other thing we, we have to think about is that um, the whole idea of epigenetic change. So uh, we're all born with a set number of genetics. Some are expressed or turned on and some are not expressed or turned off. And certain things as we go through life will turn genes on and off menopause being, you know, women certainly are at a higher risk of epigenetic change because we have monthly cycles. Uh, we are the ones giving birth. Um, we also have a higher emotional capacity. So um, stressful events typically affect us physically more than a male, but menopause being one of those key uh, opportunities for epigenetic change. So you can have no issues with thyroid your entire life hit menopause, and all of a sudden, now you've got a thyroid problem, right? So this is a particular patient population that I am watching that thyroid like a hawk, mm. right? The other thing is, you know, both hypothyroid symptoms and hyperthyroid symptoms can mimic those of menopause. So, you know, it's also something, if I have a patient coming to me saying, 
I'm really hot and I'm starting to have palpitations, which are both symptoms of menopause and hyperthyroidism, I'm going to check. I'm going to make sure that it's not just menopause doing this. I want to make sure that thyroid isn't playing a role. And the same can be said for hypothyroidism, where we have brain fog and low energy and weight gain. Um, I'll want to check in on the thyroid there as well to make sure that it's not just lack of estrogen doing the the job here. Yeah, that's great. Uh, That brings up the question. Do medical doctors and naturopathic doctors have different ways of testing for these things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is, um, I I know a lot of patients are frustrated around their primary care physicians or their family doctors and the, the lack of thyroid testing where a lot of medical doctors will just run something called a TSH or a thyroid stimulating hormone. Um, We should be more angry at the system than we are at our medical doctors, at least here in Ontario. This is an OHIP strategy, not so much a clinical one by the doctor. So OHIP allows TSH testing annually and will allow further testing if the TSH is abnormal, right? There's the obstacle. The downside for me as a naturopath is that, you know, kind of to back it up, that your TSH is based on your T4 levels. Okay, so what happens here, your thyroid gland, which sits in your neck, it secretes both T4 and T3. T4 peripherally will be converted to T3, which is what we want. We want to make sure there's good conversion because T3 is the more metabolically active hormone. The brain is constantly screening the body for how much T4 is in the system. So the brain only cares about T4, not T3. Okay. So if the brain sees that T4 is good, your TSH will be good. But here's the problem. Mm -hmm. If your T4 is good because you're not converting it to T3 peripherally, your TSH looks normal, but you don't have enough active T3, which will present like a textbook hypothyroid case in the presence of a normal TSH. So this is why it's really important to check TSH T4 and T3 to get a better idea of what's really happening in the body. Wow. So my question is, if you furnish your doctor with that request, can they fulfill that request for you? Um, They usually say no, that they don't think it's necessary. Um, Even in the treatment of thyroid from, from a pharmaceutical standpoint, the number one First line therapy here is a drug called Synthroid and it's just T4. So they don't, they don't even see value in checking T3. So even if you do have a hypothyroid diagnosis and they give you medication, they're still just checking TSH and T4. And again, those, I mean, once I give a body T4, your TSH, your T4 numbers are going to look great. But what's ha- what's your conversion doing? Do you have enough active T3? Right. So I got a lot, I've got, and I see it all the time. I have patients who come to me saying the doc, my doctor found hypothyroid. I'm being medicated, but I feel no different. Right. So then I run the T3 and I see that they're not converting well. Things that will block conversion here of T4 to T3, um, stress Mm -hmm. is a big one. Looking at iron and vitamin D levels in the body as well can block and also melatonin. We want to check that sleep wake cycle because we can see low melatonin could be high cortisol. That's the relationship which would block conversion. So when we optimize conversion, then the patient start finally starts to feel better. Wow. So you've unpacked a lot there and I've got some questions. (laughs) Yes. So did I just hear that, or did I just think that high vitamin D levels can block that conversion? No, the opposite. So a deficiency Ah. of vitamin D. Okay. So then looking at our diet, looking at the supplements that we take, that's something that somebody that would go to you as a naturopathic doctor, you would be asking those kinds of questions to know what it is they're taking. Well, absolutely. I mean, I would, every patient, I look at everything they're currently taking. And then uh, particularly my thyroid patients, even when they're already medicated, even when they present to me a TSH level that is perfectly normal, that was done last week, I will still say it's not enough. 
it's not enough. I need to see that tea. Cause you know, and their chief concern is fatigue, but my yeah. thyroid's fine. Well, we actually don't know that yet. The other thing I'll bring into the conversation here is that I'm finding majority of my female hypothyroid patients also have Hashimoto's or their hypothyroidism is due to Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Also not something typically ruled out or in by a primary care physician. So Hashimoto's is the autoimmune disease that affects the thyroid. Being autoimmune, there is usually a systemic effect here, but we we can catch it uh, looking at a full thyroid panel. This is a, an inflammatory condition. My approach to treating Hashimoto's is different than if there isn't Hashimoto's there. Uh, medical doctors, the way they see Hashimoto's is it's only worth treating if it's actually affecting the thyroid hormones, which they would use Synthroid anyway. So they don't see the clinical value in ruling Hashimoto's in or out. Uh, I certainly do, particularly in women's health, uh, more specifically around fertility. Mm -hmm. So that also then leads to to correct a thyroid imbalance. So you talked about Synthroid, which is the, the common one that a doctor would prescribe. Are there different kinds of medications? Uh, yeah, they also have a pharmaceutical, just a straight T3, which you don't see them uh, use often. I'm not sure. Um, I think it's just really algorithmically and it's hard to find for them. Anyhow, I think to find that right uh, ratio of T4 to T3. Um, I don't know, is it lack of understanding, uh, lack of sufficient evidence to support using both of them and what that would look like? So there is a T3, but I don't see it used often. It's usually Synthroid, which is just T4. Um, from my end, uh, I do have my prescription license. So I do have access to a desiccated thyroid medication. This is a both, this is a combination T4 and T3 medication which is helpful because it means that if I have a patient who's having a hard time converting their T4 to T3, I can use the desiccated thyroid to increase their T3 so that they feel that metabolic improvement. Mm -hmm. um, alternatively, we always check on things like vitamin D and iron to make sure that those levels are optimal. Otherwise we're hitting our heads against a wall with thyroid. If they aren't, mm -hmm. uh, if you have Hashimoto, selenium being as an antioxidant, having the highest affinity for the thyroid. So taking selenium really kind of protects that thyroid from the autoimmune process. And then of course there are, we can use herbs, plant-based medicine comes in really well here in terms of managing symptoms of hyper or hypothyroidism and improving, you know, looking at stress management to improve conversion. Um, it, it really is a, a comprehensive approach to yeah. thyroid versus just a, a synthroid, right? Which is the only thing that's really discussed when a medical doctor determines your thyroid is, is low. Yeah. So all of the things that you're mentioning, you're not suggesting we take them. You're saying that those are the things that you often will go to when someone has come to you and you've done a full check on who they are and what they're taking and what's going on with them. Is that right? Absolutely. That, you know, I, I, I'm very particular in, in prescribing and knowing the whole person allergies, but they're currently taking any other um, concurrent diagnoses that may be playing a role, always seek uh, professional assistance or guidance when starting to take anything. Yeah, that's very important. Mm -hmm. So from your perspective, what do you want us to know? about this realm of hot flashes, menopause, and thyroid? What are the main takeaways that you would like us to take? I think, first of all, I think a proper assessment as you move into perimenopause and further into menopause, make sure you're, you're prompting your medical doctor, your naturopath for proper assessment, because we, we know all of the things that can go awry here. So let's see which parts of these are affecting you. This is part of women's anatomy and biology. It is a natural process that we go through, but we know so much more now that to sit back and suffer because our grandmothers did it is no longer uh, necessary. There are treatments that are effective and safe. I will underline in bold 
and endorse that statement with everything I can to help you get through this part of your life with the added benefit of preventative health, right? So reducing your risk of these things like um, cardiovascular disease, dementia, uh, colon cancer, type two diabetes, joint pain, like mental health, there's so much uh, benefit. And in terms of the thyroid, uh, that comes in there with that proper assessment, right? Make sure that your thyroid is being monitored as you go through this perimenopause and into menopause. I have now been in practice long enough where I've tracked many women from the time their period started to skip to the time when their period stopped completely, where their thyroid was fine the whole way. And then a year after their last period, that's when their thyroid flipped. So if we stopped checking, because we were like, well, the past three years has been fine. Mm -hmm. If we stopped checking, that female would be running around with an undiagnosed hypothyroid and not feeling good. It's very important for us to take control of our own health and to pay attention to how we're feeling. And, you know, sometimes these symptoms and these discomforts and things can, can roll in. And then we just kind of adjust to them thinking that they're normal. Mm-hmm. And, and it's really important if you pay attention to your body and, and the way you're feeling and thinking and experiencing life. And then you will notice if there are any subtle changes. And of course, you'll definitely notice any of the big changes. But by paying attention and then knowing your own body, you'll more likely be able to determine when something is out of whack, something's not quite right. And then coming to somebody like yourself, any naturopathic doctor, but Dr. Danielle is really good at this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but going, going to somebody who can look at all of those aspects that you were talking about, and even some of the things, even the questions that you ask, mm-hmm. um, you know, can trigger, oh, yeah. That is different. You know, you might not have even realized it until somebody actually asks you the question. So there's such validity to knowing your own body and to speaking with somebody that that understands the subtleties of health. Yeah, I think I I hear all too often when I'm asked going through every system of the body and I'm asking questions, uh, I get the answer a lot of, well, you know, normal, (laughs) but always. And this could this applies to. How often do you have a bowel movement? Average or normal. Uh, Do you get pain with your periods? Normal. How much alcohol do you drink a week? Normal. Define normal. Because my answer usually, once they tell me, I am usually saying, I'm going to tell you something. (laughs) That what's common is not normal. I must say this 30 times a day. So for example, period pain, the medical term for this this dysmenorrhea is not normal. It is common, but it is not normal. And the number of women who just accept it as normal because them and her and her and her and her all have period pain, we should just suck this up and take a ridiculous amount of Advil, (laughs) right? (laughs) But we can do something about that. It's not normal. Do you have more inflammation around your uterus at the time of your menses than there should be, right? So we can do stuff to help you with that. That reminds me of a story when I was a teenager and I went to the doctor with period pain. And you know what he said to me? Oh. He said, <laughs> he said, it's normal. <laughs> he, he said, once you, once you have a baby, it will go away. Oh, that's hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> it, it didn't. <laughs> no, of course it didn't. Of course it did. Yeah. I'm, you know, I, Oh, and you know, yeah. I, have, I have three girls. I have two boys and three girls. And my, my oldest girl, will she'd be embarrassed if I shared that she's recently uh, started her period. But, you know, and I, I say to her, like, listen, don't fall into this culture of having difficult periods. It doesn't have to be this way. Now, gratefully, she's she's managing fine. But I'm I will be t- having the same conversation with all three of my girls. Like, here's a normal period. If it goes awry, talk to me because we can do something. You know, there is a fine line because, you know, the flip side of this is we're becoming 
with the access to information, you know, through Google, we are, I am starting to see, and I, I know medical doctors will really relate to this. We're starting to see a trend where uh, we are pathologizing everything. So if I have a patient who comes to me saying, uh, well, my period is 20 on day 26, one month and on day 23, the next, my hormones are out of balance. I would disagree with that right? That there is a normal, even though that's not consistent, that's not a pathology because hormones fluctuate in a female on a 20, like every day there is a hormone shift happening that it's actually normal to see an irregular cycle within a certain range. Um, so I say that because in having the conversation with my daughter, I was very, I had to walk a very fine line between, I didn't want to create a mindset for her where uh, she would start pathologizing everything about her cycle. Um, but we talked about the importance of tracking it just so we could be predictable with when it was coming. God forbid she's ever, you know, in public. Um, and then also looking at how heavy it is and how painful it is, because that's where the pathology within the period lies. Right. So if you could leave our listeners with one bit of advice about the idea of a woman's body and menopause what would you say to them oh how much time do we have uh <laughs> i think it's around the love and acceptance uh for estrogen and progesterone right we learn to hate it it's giving us breast tenderness and mood changes in this darn period every month. And then when we lose it, then we have hot flashes and sleep. Like what's this thing with estrogen? We need to flip the script and, and learn to love it and not fear it. And as you had said earlier, our healthcare system at a time when we need them to be more present, uh, it feels like they've stepped back, which then puts the advocacy in your hands. So start asking the questions, find the provider that is going to listen to you. It could be your family doctor. It could be your gynecologist. It could be your naturopath. It could be your chiropractor who doesn't have the same access to treatments, but can help you navigate the system so that you get the help, right? But you've got to find that, that person you connect with and you feel that really listens. So go find her. <laughs> particularly her. Thanks for listening. And did you know that positive reviews from listeners like you help me get these messages out into the world? Leave a rating for Own the Grey on your podcast app or at ownthegrey.ca. This episode of Own the Grey is brought to you by I Am. Discover your unique talents, realize your potential, and align to your path. Take the first step to uncover your life purpose by visiting deborahjones.ca slash courses.